Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar in the Public Health Webinar Series on Blood Disorders. This webinar is presented by the Division of Blood Disorders at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also known as the CDC. I'm Dr. Jean Grow, Professor Emeritus and former co-director of the Institute for Women's Leadership at Marquette University. I'm also the founder of GROW, a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultancy. I'm here today because I am a person with von Willebrand's disease and a member of the panel that developed the guidelines on VWD management in the collaborative initiative that we are going to tell you about today. I'm delighted to be with you and to serve as today's moderator. I'm pleased to announce and introduce my colleagues. Joining me today is Dr. Nathan Cannell. He is an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and an associate physician in the hematology division at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. His clinical interests include thrombosis and hemostasis, with a particular interest in the spectrum of clinical disorders related to von Willebrand factor. As a systems-based hematologist, his research evaluates cost-effective and quality strategies for care delivery for patients with blood disorders, and he served as the clinical vice chair for the ASH, ISTH, NHF, and WFH guideline panels on diagnosis and management of von Willebrand disease. We are grateful for his excellent leadership. I'm also delighted to introduce our third speaker, Dr. Angela Wayend, who is an assistant professor of pediatric hematology and oncology at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, where she focuses on hemostasis and thrombosis. Her clinical research and interests in von Willebrand disease and the care of young women and girls with bleeding and clotting disorders. She is also the co-founder of a multidisciplinary clinic serving this population, and she is a member of the panel that developed the ASH, ISTH, NHF, and WFH 2021 guidelines on the management of VWD. We are delighted to be with you today to provide you an overview on how the American Society of Hematology, the International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis, the National Hemophilia Foundation, and the World Federation of Hemophilia came together in a collaboration to develop evidence-based clinical practice guidelines on the diagnosis and management of EWD. We are thrilled to be able to share them with you and the global bleeding disorders community. Before we begin, I'd like to go over just a few helpful points for those joining us on the webinar today. Upon joining the webinar, you will see two audio options. You can opt in to listen via the speaker on your computer, or you can use your phone to call in. If you choose the phone option, the webinar tool will provide you with phone access number and an audio pin. All audio will be muted, and at the end of the presentation, there will be a time for questions. Please submit any written question in the questions area of the toolbar. The presenters will respond to as many questions as time allows. Today's webinar will last approximately one hour, and please note that it is being recorded, and you will receive an email after this presentation with a link where you will be able to find the recording once it is available. We'll begin today's webinar with two brief poll questions. So if you could answer the first one, we'd like to know a little bit about your affiliation. Shortly, there's going to be another one. Oh, it looks like we have a lot of healthcare providers. Um, wonderful to see our industry partners. And of course, I love seeing family members and people with bleeding disorders. So welcome everyone. The next one, we'd like to know a little bit about where you come from. <laughs> 
it is so nice to see this broad range of representation from all over the world. So welcome everyone. All right, so thank you for participating in the poll. Gathering information is really important to us. And I'm going to start the presentation um, talking a little bit about the guidelines um, for uh, VWD. So I need to tell you that I have no disclosures pertaining to the webinar. And it's my pleasure today to be here with Drs. Connell and Wayand to tell you about the development of the ASH, ISTH, NHF, WFH 2021 guidelines on the diagnosis and management of VWD, which were published just weeks ago in Blood Advances. First, a short introduction to von Willebrand disease or VWD, the most common inherited bleeding disorder, though it is a bit well less known than its cousin hemophilia. It can cause similar symptoms that can be as, as severe and have significant impact on all aspects of the lived experience of people with VWD. It's also important to know that while it is inherited equally by men and women, women are often particularly affected by heavy or abnormal periods and bleeding associated with giving birth. The project started several years ago with the four organizations, ASH, ISTH, NHF and WFH, when all of them realized there was a need for clinical practice guidelines related to BWD. There were many challenges to the accurate diagnosis and optimal management of VWD, including inaccurate, excuse me, inadequate awareness, variability in clinical practice, and a paucity of high quality evidence in the published literature. But what does that mean in human terms? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that, what, what that means reflected in my own personal journey without the benefit of these guidelines. And hopefully that puts a more human face on the impact that these guidelines will have. I grew up in a large family, seven children. I was the bleeder and my nickname was Bruiser. Um, there's my brother singing to me when I was just a baby. And my siblings sort of vacillated between protecting me and being jealous of the attention I received from my parents. So when I was five, I nearly died from a hemorrhage after a sledding accident. My mother's advocacy and the trust that she placed in a wise family physician saved my life. In 1974, when I was 19, I had surgery um, on my eardrum, I had a tympanoplastomy, and I was told that it was, quote, a non-bleeding, unquote, operation. Needless to say, it was not. I still remember the name of the physician who walked into the room postoperatively and diagnosed me with von Willebrand disease. His name was Edward Fulmanowitz. A few years before my children were born, I met a wise and kind hematologist in Chicago, Juan Chediak. Over the years, I participated in virtually every study he did. I donated my son's cord blood, participated in studies that led to FDA approval of factor products. And I was the lead subject in a three generation study of my family, which determined that my VWD was not inherited, but the result of a spontaneous mutation. In my early forties, after the birth of my two children, I had an elective hysterectomy. For me, it was a choice between that or monthly hemorrhaging. As the mother of two children, a whole nother level of anxiety comes into play when you have VWD. And by the roll of the dice, both of my children were born with VWD. While many men experienced similar symptoms to women, my son thankfully had symptoms that were actually quite manageable and his VWD caused him very few problems. My daughter's symptoms, on the other hand, were much more like mine. However, it was a little bit easier for me to manage them 
as I had grown to know a lot about the disease, having lived with it myself. Yet living with VWD is one thing. Observing it as an outsider is quite another. As a young child, my daughter had frequent bruising. And when she was about two, I had enrolled her with a new daycare provider. And I ex had explained VWD to the provider. But it quickly became apparent that she did not understand when I was visited by the police and investigation into child abuse began. You can imagine how traumatizing that experience was and how dramatically it impacted my entire family. My daughter is now 31 and living in South Carolina. She's pregnant for the third time, having had two miscarriages. The first miscarriage in 2019 required a DNC. The obstetrician told her that she did not need to be treated for her VWD during the procedure, and the hematologist on call concurred. She began to explain her need for medication as she understood it, and the physicians refused. She canceled the procedure and reached out to her trusted hematologist in Milwaukee. After he faxed his recommendation, she rescheduled the procedure and was able to get the medication she needed. I'm really proud of my daughter and her ability to advocate for herself, especially after having to deal with miscarrying. But it also strikes me that more than 40 years after my non-bleeding tympanoplastomy, that the same lack of understanding or misunderstanding among healthcare professionals put her in that dangerous situation. But these are the human realities that point to the urgent need for clinical guidance around BWD and for education and dissemination of these guidelines to hematologists, but also to obstetricians, dentists, and a whole range of healthcare professionals. So you can imagine that when I was invited to join the guideline development project, my answer was a very enthusiastic yes. I wasn't sure what to expect from the collaboration between the four organizations. However, I can say that it was a fantastic experience, a truly impressive collaboration among a worldwide team of experts and patients. As you can see from all the features listed here, the four organizations and the panel chairs worked intentionally to integrate people with BWD and international stakeholder communities throughout the process. People with VWD made up approximately 25% of both the management and diagnosis panels and were full voting members. We participated in prioritizing topics to be addressed, discussed the evidence with doctors and researchers, debated all aspects of each recommendation, and are now involved in the education and dissemination of the guidelines. Dr. Connell will provide more detail about the actual process of developing the guidelines shortly. The bleeding disorders community has always been very engaged, as I think my story illustrates. We've had to be. Keeping informed and advocating for ourselves, often bringing our knowledge and expertise to the healthcare system has been essential. At the beginning of this process, we did an international trilingual stakeholder survey to ask people what they thought was important to cover in these guidelines. The community responded with over 600 individual responses and over 9,500 comments. Not bad for a rare disorder. A few years and a lot of work later, we posted a draft of the guidelines online and asked for public comment. Again, the response was fantastic. Over 100 people commented from 38 countries and 15% of them were patients. I think this just underscores how important these guidelines are and how much the community needs and wants them. I hope it also means that they will be widely consulted and adopted. The way these guidelines were developed with the international collaboration between the four organizations and the integral involvement of people with VWD based on available evidence and all of our combined expertise, I am confident that these guidelines will serve people with VWD and those who care for them very well. For the bleeding disorder community, these guidelines are a beautiful life-affirming gift. <laughs>
I would like to extend my sincere thanks to ASH, ISTH, NHF, and WFH. I think I am speaking for all the members of the guideline panel when I say we are grateful to have the opportunity to participate in this process, and we are proud to offer these guidelines to the community. With that, I'm gonna turn things over to Drs. Connell and Wayand. So, Dr. Connell. Thank you, Dr. Groh. I'm very pleased to be with everyone today to talk about our work on the guidelines and especially the ways in which we integrated patients into the decision-making process, as you've outlined. And we'll be taking some questions at the end as well. And so uh, to begin, I have no financial disclosures related to this talk or to the guideline development process itself. And I'm gonna start off with describing the logistics and the details about how guidelines are developed and the process we went through to take an evidence-based to uh, evidence-based recommendations. And so the collaboration objectives were first to facilitate clinical decision-making regarding VWD with the hope to improve health outcomes, quality of life, and health equity. Coming with that is an important need to increase access to appropriate diagnostic testing, and once you've made the diagnosis, ensure access to therapeutic options. Importantly, we knew we were going to run into a lot of roadblocks where we didn't have high quality evidence to guide the decision-making process, so we would use this as an opportunity to identify research priorities for future work. And also, we wanted to be able to guide all of the stakeholders um, on what should be priority focus areas in VWD. The guideline development process spans over several years. Um, a key piece of this is developing 10 to 20 clinically relevant questions in what is called PICO format. And PICO stands for looking at a population or a patient group of interest, thinking about an intervention such as a test or a treatment such as an infusion. What is a comparison, a different test, a different infusion, and looking at the outcomes, how do people do? We then ask a methods team with expertise in systematic reviews of medical literature to generate evidence summaries, looking back through decades of research to see what is actually out there to, to answer the question we have posed. It's easy to just look at data, but being able to structure it in a way that allows you to come to some objective recommendation is done through what we called evidence to decision frameworks that evaluated resource use, feasibility and acceptability, as well as also incorporating patient preferences and values. And the end goal with the uh, this process is to make recommendations based on these frameworks. And so the entire process is transparent. Now, this is a, a, a very complex slide because it tries to summarize all of what happens uh, in one of these guideline development processes. And this uh, is a slide from my colleague, Dr. Reem Mustafa, who served as our methodology co-chair for the effort. PICOs are generated, we look at what are outcomes, and the methods team generates these evidence profiles. They rate the evidence and look at things like randomized controlled trials, but also observational studies. They look at issues such as bias or inconsistency in the trials, and how big is the effect? We then come up with a series of recommendations, and at the center of all of this is the panel. Again, stakeholders, including patients and clinicians, scientists and researchers. And all of this is available with the guideline uh, in publication. You'll see that we have both what we call strong and conditional recommendations. And this is different for what a patient, clinician, or policymaker might take away. Strong recommendations indicate most patients would want the intervention, whereas a conditional recommendation suggests the majority would, but many would not. For clinicians, this really helps us guide decision-making, but also emphasizes the importance of shared decision-making, especially where there is not much evidence. 
And for policymakers, we may need to have substantial debate develop, depending on the level of evidence and the strength of the recommendation. For context, the panels took a perspective of a high resource setting. And this was important because we wanted to understand what might be the goal of optimal care. We understand that many places globally are not going to have access to the exact same tests and treatment, but if that wasn't a barrier, what would be optimal? And this would allow us to also help support advocacy efforts and policy work so that individuals in other countries and areas of the world could then work towards these ideals. There's a term in uh, guideline development called adolopment, which is uh, a combination of adaptation, how do you adapt it to your resource area, adopting specific recommendations, and where are areas in which you need de novo at development of guidelines. And the patient panelists, as Dr. Groh mentioned, were full voting members throughout. The next couple of slides highlight the two panels. So this is the diagnosis panel uh, that was chaired by Dr. Paula James with Dr. Reem Mustafa as uh, the methods co-chair and I served as the vice chair. The VWD management panel was chaired by Dr. Veronica Flood with methodologists Dr. Reem Mustafa and Dr. Romina Brigner Dello Peterson. And I also served as a coordinating vice chair for this to really try to focus the work of the two panels together. All of this was supported by a methods team. And again, thinking about the literally thousands of articles that they went through over decades of VWD research to give us answers to questions that we were posing to them, uh, it's really important to recognize the hard work that this group put in to get us to where we are today. So in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about the diagnosis of von Willebrand disease specifically, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Wyand to talk about management of VWD. The broad areas that we covered in the diagnosis of VWD included the use of bleeding assessment tools, evaluating assays of platelet binding activity of von Willebrand factor. What do we do with von Willebrand factor levels that normalize with aging? What are the diagnostic thresholds? At what point should you say that this lab is evidence of support for VWD type 1? How should we approach type 1C VWD? And also thinking quite a bit about type 2. And today I'm going to focus a lot on the diagnostic thresholds for type 1 VWD. The question we posed to the methods team was in looking at patients with an abnormal initial screen suspected of type 1, should we use a diagnostic cutoff of the von Willebrand factor antigen or activity at less than 30% or 50%? And after reviewing all of the data and the evidence and layering in many of these domains that I mentioned in evidence to decision, the recommendation six in the diagnosis guideline recommends using a level of 30% regardless of bleeding and for patients who have abnormal bleeding, using a level of less than 50 to confirm the diagnosis of VWD. And this was a strong recommendation, even though there was low certainty in the evidence of effects. There were some remarks that the panel offered to further clarify that when we say VWF levels, we mean the amount of protein or its activity that if the lower limit of the normal range in the local laboratory is not 50%, that the, that level should be used. And because bleeding follows um, level of protein, which can be affected by ABO, there was a question about using uh, blood type specific ranges, but this was not required in the uh, uh, expertise of the panel. We also recommended a recognition that um, VWF is an acute phase reactant that can go up in response to a variety of stimuli, and it should be performed when patients are at their baseline status of health. Guiding the recommendation were nine studies uh, looking at mutation detection, correlating uh, levels with bleeding scores, and looking at different likelihood ratios and prospective evaluations. One of the pieces of evidence that was reviewed was this paper by Dr. Veronica Flood and colleagues published in 2016 in Blood. Uh, 
that showed that patients who had lower levels were more likely to be found to have a mutation or a sequence variant in von Willebrand factor. However, if you look here, there are still a significant number of patients who will have these mutations, and so this cannot be used alone to make or exclude the diagnosis of VWD. What we also see is that uh, there is a significant amount of bleeding that occurs across a variety of, um, uh, of, of VWF levels, but even patients who have levels between 40 and 60 percent have a significant amount of bleeding depending on the context. What we looked at here were likelihood ratios, essentially thinking of the lower your VWF level, the greater the likelihood you would be diagnosed with VWD based on all the factors together. So for instance, in the paper by uh, Alberto Tassetto and colleagues in 2007, patients who had a level less than 20 were 375 times more likely to be diagnosed uh, with VWD than patients with levels above this. Um, but as you can see, we set a cutoff level of 50%. There was some consideration of setting a cutoff at 40, but given that the assays aren't exactly perfect at discriminating between 39 and 41 percent, for instance, we wanted to make sure that there was increased access to treatment for patients who had bleeding symptoms. So in considering this, we did not want to miss the diagnosis in patients who bleed, and we wanted to avoid overdiagnosis, which is how we settled on 50 percent. There was a high value placed on explicit diagnosis to ensure access to care and also to ensure international uniformity in the diagnostic criteria. Other key recommendations that came out of the diagnosis guideline looked at use of bleeding assessment tools, and we do recommend using these validated tools as an initial screening test, particularly in the primary care setting. We suggested that newer assays that measure platelet binding activities, such as glycoprotein 1BM or glycoprotein 1BR, be used over ristocetin based assays um, based on the available data. The panel identified several research priorities, including detailed data for patients with VWF levels between 30 and 60 percent, and looking at outcomes for bleeding with procedures, or is, there, is the VWD being inherited with another bleeding disorder that also requires management? And correlating bleeding symptoms with patients and family members of patients with type 1 VWD. And this is just an example that there are uh, research priorities. This was for the diagnostic threshold question, but there were actually tons of research priorities identified across all of the questions. This was, I think, a key piece of what we offered in the manuscript. Um, these are algorithms that can be used to actually go through and start a patient's diagnostic journey and think about how do you subtype them to get them to the proper treatment. Um, the, on the left is a global uh, algorithm that starts in patients suspected of VWD and goes down through how do you rule it out. How do you think about patients who have um, increased clearance? How do you look at patients who have protein, but it doesn't function exactly like it should, like in type 2? And then there are much more detailed algorithms about the role of specific testing, including genetic testing, in patients with VWD uh, with type 2 variants. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wyand, and uh, I'll be back at the end for some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Connell. My name is Dr. Angela Wyand, and I am a pediatric hematologist oncologist, and I'm excited to be here today uh, to talk about some of our specific recommendations uh, that were made on the management guidelines panel. I don't have any relevant disclosures to what I'm going to discuss today. And this is kind of a broad overview, um, similar to what Dr. Connell presented for the diagnosis guidelines, but this is for the management guidelines. So we talked about prophylaxis. We talked about the need for a desmopressin challenge or trial before treatment. We looked at antithrombotic and antiplatelet therapy in patients with bone disease. 
We looked at how to treat uh, before major and minor surgery. And then we had some more uh, female focused questions looking at heavy menstrual bleeding and um, some guidelines for neuraxial anesthesia and postpartum management. So I'm gonna discuss a few of these in more detail today um, before we go to our question and answer session. The first being um, minor surgery. So clearly as you all heard from Dr. Groves' presentation, minor surgery um, can be a big thing for patients with von Willebrand's disease and they clearly need appropriate treatment to avoid um, what can be pretty extensive bleeding. So when the initial survey went out prior to the panel convening, um, this was definitely a topic that had been prioritized by a lot of people, including the patient community as a whole. So for one of our questions, we decided to look at for patients with von Willebrand's disease undergoing a minor surgery or minor procedure, should we increase the VWF level to greater than 50% with the use of factor or desmopressin? Should we use antifibrinolytics such as tranexamic acid alone? Or should we use both of those treatments together? And after reviewing all of the evidence, we came to two specific recommendations. The first was that in patients undergoing minor surgery or a minor procedure, um, that we should be using the combination of increasing factor levels to greater than 50% with either VWF concentrate or desmopressin, in addition to the use of tranexamic acid. This was a conditional recommendation as there was very low certainty in the evidence. The second part of this recommendation wanted to really acknowledge that there's probably a subset of patients out there, um, most commonly patients with type one von Willebrand's disease who have baseline levels greater than 30% and have a mild bleeding phenotype. And in these patients, if they're undergoing very low risk procedures, um, they may do well with tranexamic acid alone. This also was a conditional recommendation as there was very low certainty in the evidence. When looking at these recommendations, we wanted to be sure to make a few things clear. Um, the first of which was that all of the surgical planning really needs to be individualized. So each patient is going to be different. Their subtype of von Willebrand's disease is different. Their bleeding phenotype is different as are the procedures and the um, risks associated with those procedures in terms of how likely bleeding is to occur and how big of a deal it will be if that bleeding does occur. Additionally, we wanted to point out that there are multiple subsets of patients, including patients with type 3 von Willebrand's disease and many with type 2, who are not going to be candidates for desmopressin and will require VWF concentrate. Additionally, we wanted to make sure that clinicians were considering the fact that there is data that suggests that extended elevation of VWF and factor VIII levels can be associated with thrombosis, even in patients with von Willebrand's disease. And so it's important to be aware of this risk when you're using those either factor or desmopressin to increase your levels um, and maybe using tranexamic acid for an extended period of time that in patients with other risk factors, um, you may want to avoid those things together. Additionally, um, a lot of procedures, especially dental procedures, um, may benefit from the use of local hemostatic measures. So when we were coming to these recommendations, we looked at a few bodies of evidence, the first of which were, were two randomized trials which compared the use of factor to factor plus tranexamic acid. Additionally, we looked at a number of different case series, some of those focusing on the use of factor alone and some of those focusing on the use of tranexamic acid alone. Looking at the data from the randomized clinical trials, it was shown that using factor concentrate or desmopressin alone was associated with an increased risk of postoperative bleeding with a relative risk of 6.29 compared to when those treatments were used in combination with tranexamic acid. This also translated to a higher mean blood loss in patients who were just treated with factor concentrate or desmopressin alone. Turning to the case series of patients, um, we reviewed that patients treated with factor concentrate or desmopressin alone experienced bleeding in 11% of patients um, compared to 14% of patients that were treated with tranexamic acid alone. So 
based on those recommend based on that literature, we came to those recommendations, but wanted to highlight how there really continues to be a lack of data, um, as you can see from the data that was reviewed for the recommendations, and that there are definitely a lot of opportunities for future research in this field. The first of which we wanted to highlight was the use of tranexamic acid versus possibly not needing tranexamic acid for certain procedures. Second, we believe that there's a lot of opportunity in further studies to determine differences in outcomes based on a number of different factors, including the type of procedure, the anatomic site that the procedure is being performed at, the type of antifibrinolytic used, as well as the von Willebrand's disease subtype. Another area that I wanted to cover um, that is very near and dear to my heart, and I think is a very important issue in von Willebrand's disease, is treatment of heavy menstrual bleeding. So heavy menstrual bleeding is very common in von Willebrand's disease and is the most common symptom seen in women who are affected. It can affect up to 92% of women and can have really severe effects on lots of areas of life. So when we were making our recommendations, the question that we sought to answer was in women with von Willebrand's disease and heavy menstrual bleeding, what should first-line therapy be? Should we treat with tranexamic acid, a hormonal option, or desmopressin? After reviewing all of the literature, we came to two separate recommendations, the first of which was for women who have heavy menstrual bleeding and are not currently wishing to conceive. In those patients, we suggest using a hormonal option or tranexamic acid over desmopressin to treat their heavy menstrual bleeding. Clearly, in women who are currently wishing to conceive, hormonal options are not gonna be good options. So our second part of the recommendation suggests using tranexamic acid over desmopressin in these women. Things we wanted to communicate about these recommendations um, were the fact that although we were evaluating these therapies as monotherapy, they often are used alone, um, and that should definitely be considered, especially if patients are not responding to one therapy. Additionally, similar to the last recommendation I discussed, desmopressin is not going to be effective in certain patients, um, and so should not be used for heavy menstrual bleeding in those patients. There also has been some concern as the intrauterine system can be effective for heavy menstrual bleeding, but often requires a few menstrual cycles in order to take effect. So women may require additional treatment with other options during those first few cycles after placement. Lastly, we really wanted to emphasize that when feasible, um, the care of these women really can be improved um, with the development of multidisciplinary clinics. So oftentimes that is gynecology and hematology together, and sometimes within pediatrics can be hematology and adolescent medicine, but this really can improve the care of these challenging patients. So looking at the evidence, again, there was not a large quantity of evidence to support our recommendations, but we did look at two comparative studies, one of which was a randomized clinical trial, which was a crossover design, another of which was an observational study. And additionally, we looked at five different case series about use of the levonorgestrel intrauterine system. So the clinical trials, the first was a randomized clinical trial that was a crossover design. So women were randomized to receive either tranexamic acid or desmopressin, which they received for a few cycles before they crossed over to the alternate treatment. This figure illustrates that patients who were treated with tranexamic acid had a greater decrease in their menstrual blood loss than patients who were treating with desmopressin, and this was statistically significant. There were not serious adverse effects in either group, and differences between adverse effects were not estimable. Of note, both groups did have improved quality of life, although this was not statistically significant. The second study we looked at was an observational study which compared the use of combined hormonal therapy with desmopressin, and there was no difference in effectiveness in that study. We then looked at five different case series that totaled 82 patients, 56 of which had von Willebrand's disease, with the remainder having other bleeding disorders. Altogether, those series suggests that the intrauterine system is effective for controlling heavy menstrual bleeding as measured by a variety of outcomes, including hemoglobin, duration of bleeding, pictorial bleeding assessment chart score, and health-related quality of life. 
there has been some concern in the community that patients with von Willebrand's disease or other bleeding disorders may have a higher risk of expulsion of the intrauterine system, but on the review of that data, the rates of expulsion and malposition were similar to what is seen in the general population. Again, uh, we highlighted that there's a lot of research that is needed in this area. Um, the first area that we wanted to highlight was on studies on the use of combined therapy versus single therapy. Um, this is particularly pertinent in the area of using hormones in addition to antifibrinolytics. So in the United States, there's a contraindication on antifibrinolytics for use with hormonal therapy. Um, so studies on efficacy as well as safety are really needed, especially in light of the fact that multiple countries treat lots of women with these treatments concurrently. Next, we felt like studies assessing patients' values and preferences um, regarding the specific benefits and harms of the various methods um, would definitely help to inform future care. And lastly, given the concerns about the intrauterine system in terms of bleeding following placement, risk of expulsion, um, and issues with menstrual spotting, a prospective study of the intrauterine system and von Willebrand's disease would also be helpful. So I was gonna speak quickly about a few other management recommendations that we made. Um, the first of which looked at prophylaxis. So um, we frequently use prophylaxis in our hemophilia patients as that has become standard of care in especially severe patients, but this is something I think is not always considered in von Willebrand's disease. But after review of the literature, we recommend that in patients with a history of severe and frequent bleeds, long-term prophylaxis um, should be considered. This was also a conditional recommendation based on low certainty and the evidence of effects. The other recommendation I wanted to touch on was the use of a desmopressin trial prior to treatment. And so after the review of the literature, um, our recommendation was in patients with type, primarily type 1 von Willebrand's disease whose baseline levels are less than 30%, um, we would suggest performing a trial of desmopressin and then determining treatment based on the results of that trial rather than either not performing a trial and using desmopressin or just treating with an alternative therapy. There is some evidence that in patients with levels greater than 30% that they are more likely to be responsive to desmopressin, and so those patients may not always require a trial. This also was a conditional recommendation based on very low certainty in the evidence of effects. So that um, we'll wrap up our presentation on the specific recommendations from the guideline panels. I did want to be sure and highlight that the four sponsoring organizations have done a really great job working on ways to really educate, disseminate, and implement these new guidelines that we've created. Um, so you can find the guidelines themselves on the Blood Advances page, and that is open access. Um, you also can find materials on the guidelines at any of the sponsoring organizations' websites, um, and materials include webinars such as the one you're currently watching, um, some pocket guides, patient-facing materials. Um, they have these little snapshots that kind of provide a high-level view of what the guidelines are, and these have been interpret translated into various different languages and are all available online, so be sure to check those out if you can. And with that, we will move along to our uh, live question and answer period. Hopefully my co-speakers will be joining us. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them into the question box um, that's in the control panel and we'd be happy to answer any things that come up. While we wait for the questions, maybe I'll throw out a question to, to Dr. Wyand um, about the experience of, of collaborating across age groups and trying to think about an evidence base that, you know, I, I take care of adults and you uh, are based in pediatrics. And, and how, how was it trying to sort through that and think about what are the specific issues in the pediatric setting as opposed to what I think of in adults. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I think that was really interesting. I think as a pediatric hematologist, um, we are very aware, as most pediatricians are, that there's such a dearth of data when it comes to peds versus adults. And so I think a lot of the studies that we were basing the guidelines on were based in adult studies. One in particular um, is the one I just touched on in the Desmopressin trial, um, where I've had a lot of discussions with Dr. Lavin, who was also on the panel, about whether or not their data suggesting levels greater than 30% should be almost universally responsive to DDADP and maybe how that doesn't necessarily translate to, to children. So I think we tried to kind of make little comments in there and, and specify very specific populations that the recommendations hold for, but it's definitely a challenge um, when you don't have a lot of data in that population. It looks like we are getting some questions, so I will um, see what we have here. So. The first question is, what are your thoughts on the use of heme libra in type three von Willebrand's disease? Um, I have a lot of thoughts, but maybe I'll let Dr. Cannell answer first if he has thoughts about that. It, it's, I think it's a fantastic question. And I, I understand that Dr. Wine is gonna have a lot of thoughts on it as I think she was the first one to ever publish on experience of use of, of that uh, in type three. Um, it, you know, there's a lot. There was a lot of discussion during the panel about uh, a related question that was talking about factor eight levels versus von Willebrand factor levels in the peri procedural setting. You know, emicizumab hemlibra is going to provide the same effect that factor eight does. And so, what is really the key hemostatic protein? Is it going to be factor eight? Therefore emicizumab would be helpful, or is it von Willebrand factor? As with most things, it's probably a complicated question of the interplay between all of it together. Um, I think it's really promising. There's some more studies that are out there, and I think I would love to see a, a clinical trial um, get off the ground to that. But I'd love to hear your thoughts, Dr. Ryan, since you, you're the one that kicked this <laughs> off with your publication. Yeah, so we, we did publish, it's been a little bit now, about one of our patients that has type 3 um, that had an inhibitor who um, was having a lot of joint bleeding um, and definitely had more of a phenotype consistent with that factor 8 deficiency, less mucosal bleeding. Um, and he has done really, really well on hemolibra. I think that um, definitely if you have a patient who seems to be having more mucosal bleeding um, due to the low von Willebrand's factor versus more, you know, hemarthroses and muscle hematomas um, that I, I, I'm not sure how it, how it would work in those patients, um, but I think definitely in the patients that have more of a hemophilia type phenotype, um, it, it's exciting and is definitely something that I agree with Dr. Pinnell. We need more data on. Um, so hopefully that will, that will come at some point. So the next question, are there any recommendations regarding what route to give desmopressin and or dosing considerations for the different considerations? I don't, please, I'm, Dr. I'm happy, I'm happy to chat about that. Um, you know, desmopressin comes in a couple of different routes. Uh, you know, traditionally it's been intravenous, and so it works well as an intravenous infusion. It's important to think about how fast it's infused to limit the likelihood of side effects. Um, even with those mitigation strategies, a lot of people do have side effects from it, and that may be a limiting factor in its use in specific patients. Um, it's uh, traditionally also been available intranasally. Um, we've heard from the manufacturer that there was a concern over the, the dose that was being delivered and was it accurate. Um, we've, uh, we're hopeful that we would have it back on the market this year, although I believe the most recent release is saying 2023 is probably when it's going to be back on the market. So it's going to be tough for a lot of our patients who have been able to self-treated home for minor bleeds and, and avoid coming into the hospital or clinic. Um, what I was fascinated to realize that I, I, with all the times I've used desmopressin is that subcutaneous dosing is an option in some patients. And uh, that was one of the things I learned from the pediatricians on the, the panel about it. So, um, you know, the dosing strategy is 0.3 micrograms per kilogram in most instances. Um, in uh, many places, we do recommend a cap that it's typically 20 micrograms max in adults uh, to limit side effects and free water retention leading to low sodium levels. 
Great. Um, so I will go, actually, the next question is kind of piggybacking off of that one and is what are you using in place of desmopressin since stimmate is on recall? Um, so I'll share what we're doing. You know, it's it's been really unfortunate and I think there's a lot of really frustrated clinicians and patients um, just because there's not kind of a comparable medication that we can use in those scenarios. So um, in patients who have kind of recurrent bleeds, I sometimes find antifibrinolytics can be helpful where you're having nosebleeds, taking antifibrinolytic is not going to stop the nosebleed acutely, but may help if you get you know, a nosebleed again later that day or, or the next day, it may help prevent that. Um, we are using factor, um, which obviously is not as easy to do. Um, patients can't just do that easily at home. Um, and then I think a lot of people are looking into if subcutaneous CDAVP may um, be an option given that it's gonna be such an extended time before intranasal is back. Have you been doing anything else, Dr. Canal? No, you know, I I have patients that are also newly diagnosed and they want to be treated at home and I've had to have them come in for infusion. And then what's challenging, especially is when the uh, procedure that they need is going to be at a site other than where we can treat them. So they come in, they get infused, and then they drive to their dentist's office to get their wisdom teeth out. Um, and so antifibrinolytics have been very helpful, but um, for patients with a significant bleeding phenotype, it may not be enough. Agreed. Yeah, we've had a lot of that as well, like driving from our infusion to, to a procedure outpatient. Um, another question, this would be good for you, Dr. Cannell, is BWD type three excluded from the diagnosis diagram algorithm? Um, they are not seeing it on there. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic question. And so with the guidelines, we weren't able to prioritize every single question that we wanted to prioritize. And so um, it, it's clear in the discussion and that there's a lot more text to the, the diagnosis uh, manuscript that you'll see. Um, we don't specifically address certain questions around type 3 VWD, other than the recognition that using appropriate assays to make sure that you're going to be getting levels, uh, accurate results on the test that you're sending to really confirm that somebody has an absence of von Willebrand factor. It wasn't included in the diagrams because of the focus on um, distinguishing subtypes of type one and type two, um, but type three VWD is woven throughout all of the guidelines because we didn't specifically say a lot about management of specific types, but trying to tie it more to phenotype to generate treatment recommendations. Thank you. Um, so another question regarding recommendation 6B. So this is the recommendation on um, heavy menstrual bleeding um, in patients wishing to conceive. If desmopressin is not an option, should TXA then be the only treatment or would you recommend to use factor concentrate? So we did have a kind of side note in that recommendation on heavy menstrual bleeding that um, patients with heavy menstrual bleeding that have severe recurrent bleeding would fit into that recommendation number one, um, that that factor prophylaxis should be considered. And um, there are women that are treated with factor prophylaxis, you know, monthly, whether that's, you know, how many doses is, is pretty variable, but um, that definitely should be considered in patients that are having really severe heavy menstrual bleeding, um, in addition to TXA or, or other treatments, but uh, factor concentrate can definitely be used in those situations. Um, let's see, what can be done, Dr. Cannell, when one doctor says you have von Willebrand's disease and then another one says you don't? This question is for a friend who has twin boys that are very active. That is, that is such an important question and I think it gets back to what we as a panel thought about very early on about what colloquially during the panel discussions became called the diagnostic journey what happens when a patient has a symptom and how do they get to an accurate diagnosis? Um, and uh, I'll give my thoughts a little bit on this, but I would also like to hear Dr. Groh's thoughts as a patient who went through this with herself and, and her children about, about these diagnostic journeys. Um, you know, it's, it's really important to be seen at a center that has expertise in it. Um, and I think a key piece in the 
the, the difficulty in getting an accurate diagnosis is the fact that our tests, what's available to actually send in diagnostic testing may not be as accurate as we think it is. Um, it was, you know, I remember sitting at an ISTH meeting years ago learning about a certain polymorphism in VWF that led to falsely low activity levels um, in patients with this polymorphism if you used a ristocetin-based assay. A former mentor of mine had given the ristocetin-based assays, you know, a C minus in terms of a test to actually tell you what you're thinking you're getting. Um, and what I found also learned was that, you know, this, this polymorphism is so prevalent in African Americans here in the United States um, that you're probably misclassifying a lot of people. And so using the best and most accurate test, I think, is an important piece. You know, certain centers have abilities to send out and do more detailed testing on site versus what they send out. There are data out there about, you know, the timing is important. If you send it during an acute, stressful, bleeding event when somebody's in the emergency room, you may have levels that appear normal, but at baseline they wouldn't be. And so you need to think about that. And if it takes getting multiple opinions to sort through conflicting decisions and, and discussions, that's an important piece of, of the diagnostic journey. And that's why the collaborating organizations are, have all have expertise in getting people connected to appropriate treatment centers. But Dr. Crow, I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts on what do you what would you what do you do when there's conflicting advice that you or your children were getting along the way? So actually, I think this is a really important discussion point, and it does. You're right; it comes back to multiple, at least a second opinion, but maybe more than that. And that means having access, I think, to uh, oftentimes teaching centers, places where you have physicians who have a deeper understanding of the disease. Um, and it's really problematic. And you brought up um, the differences in the African American community. And in general, there's health disparities among the Black, Hispanic, Indigenous communities, and they don't have access to these um, clinics oftentimes. So beyond getting second opinions, I think the dissemination of these guidelines in a really proactive way to underserved communities is really, really important. And it's a step toward maybe rectifying the healthcare disparities that some communities experience. Thank you both. Um, so we have a question on hoping that you could comment on the new recommendation regarding the assay that should be used instead of VWF ristocene cofactor. That's a that that really flows from what we just discussed. Um, ristocene based assays have inherent limitations. Um, the downside of that is, you know, it's what's most most widely available. Globally, it's it's what's commercially available in most places in the world. Um, looking at, at uh, newer assays, both automated and non-automated assays of GP1BM and 1PR uh, are, are both increasing in use. Um, I think that there, you know, this is going to be a call to action here in the United States to think about the availability of, of assays. Um, currently, I in patients that I really need to know, I do send specimens to um, Diversity Blood Research Institute in Wisconsin that offers this test. And so I find it helpful to have a conversation with patients about why I'm sending testing out um, to correlate with our own lab. Um, but really, you know, if you can get a newer assay, it's, it's going to probably give you more accurate results. Perfect. And then another one that kind of flows from that is are the, do you have any recommendations? I know there weren't really any recommendations in the guidelines, but for what minimum diagnostic criteria should be in resource poor countries? So we think about the US and I mean, I know at my hospital, we don't have ristocetin and we end up sending out some things, diversity and whatnot, but in other situations, clearly, you know, they may not have um, access to those send out labs. Do you have thoughts about resource poor settings and diagnosis? Yeah, um, there. Uh, I, I, Dr. Veronica Flood and I once asked um, 
Dr. Sandy Haberichter, if you could only have one test, what would you, what would you, if you were trapped on a deserted island? And I, I joke about this a lot because it's true. And it, I loved hearing that, you know, her thought was collagen binding because collagen binding is a great assay. Again, not as widely available as many places would like, um, but it's a, it's a great test to give you an answer in a lot of patients with bleeding. Um, I think that, you know, if you don't have access to the assays, if you have a patient who's phenotypically bleeding, you treat the bleeding and you, you know, work through the details. There is a, going to be a, a huge uh, effort amongst the different organizations, particularly given the, the global reach of ISTH and the WFH, to try to adapt these guidelines and think about what are these specific issues, because that comes up repeatedly in, in getting access to patients around the world. Yeah, it seems difficult to imagine that if we're struggling here with diagnosis, how much you know harder it must be in other places. Um, so Dr. Groh, I was hoping you could help us with this one. So um, this is from a patient who has um, actually was also diagnosed by Dr. Chediak and had um, was managed for her von Willebrand's disease, um, but saw a lot of gynecologists throughout her life that didn't really weren't necessarily informed about the need to work with hematology. Um, like what what can be done to try to ensure that he, you know, all these different specialties are working together. How can we try to ensure that there's a multidisciplinary team approach? Um, and what, you know, what do you see as a good way to, to try to accomplish that? It's interesting. It has very uh, similar parallels to the industry that I study where people work in silos. So I think the more we can have interdisciplinary clinics like we talked about earlier, the better. But really, I relied on my doctors. I relied on the people that I really trusted to connect me to someone in another discipline. So just reaching out to your hematologist and trying to find out which gynecologist they recommend. Sometimes they know somebody that's familiar and sometimes they don't. And that just means, I think, doing more research, going online, going to groups, just keep asking questions until you get the answer that you need. You just have to advocate for yourself. Absolutely. And hopefully these guidelines can help give patients a little more ammo to advocate for themselves, right? If things don't seem to be going the way um, you want them to. Hopefully these can be helpful. I, I'm just going to put out a little um, shout out to, there's also a foundation for women and girls with blood disorders, which does a really good job. They have on their website, like a lot of clinics that are multidisciplinary that have gynecology and hematology together. Um, so if anybody's in you know, areas and is looking for people that, that are really trying to collaborate, um, that's a great place to start. But we are five minutes over. And so despite having more questions, we don't, unfortunately don't have time to answer them. Um, but I'm just so excited that we got to do this today. I don't know if you two have any final thoughts uh, before we log off. I don't, but uh, I'll turn over to Dr. Groh. Okay, well, I really enjoyed my discussion with both of you today. Thank you for drawing the non-medical person in. Um, I would like to thank everybody who joined us today and to thank our colleagues at the CDC's Division of Blood Disorders for this opportunity to present today. Um, and we're really grateful to the Hemophilia Foundation of America for hosting today's webinar. Finally, we would like to extend our most sincere thank you to the patients who continue to donate their time and their personal, their bodies to the science that helps us do a better job with patients with VWD. So for the people who are here today, you're gonna to shortly receive an email asking for feedback and we hope that you'll respond. Uh, if you have any additional questions, you can reach out to Cynthia Sayers, that's C-S-A-Y-E-R-S at cdc.gov. And I'm trying to get to the very last slide to announce the next webinar and I'm not having much luck here. So um, there we are. So um, today's webinar is going to be available on the CDC website very shortly, and we hope that you'll join us on March 11th for the next webinar featuring Dr. Rachel Rosvalski, who will speak on the success of pulmonary embolism teams in the hospital. So thank you for joining us today. Stay safe, be well, and have a great afternoon.